I'm very pleased to welcome Perry Alexander. He's going to talk about uh, system level design and security. Thanks, John. Um, I'm going to give a, a largely non-technical talk about some new work that's been going on in my lab um, uh, that deals with system level security, which is something we've de been dealing with it, uh, uh, for a while, but I'm going to look at it in a slightly different way for a different project. Before I get started, uh, I have to acknowledge the people that I'm working with. Um, Gary Minden and Joe Evans are, are uh, also investigators in this project. They are uh, software-defined radio people, uh, networking folks that, that kind of keep us grounded. And I have to acknowledge also Garen Kimmel and Ed Comp, who are the really, really smart guys who do all the work. Um, I also should acknowledge that uh, part of the work that, that I'm presenting today was, uh, is currently being sponsored by DARPA. Um, I'm going to start with a quote that kind of sums up the problem that, that I try to deal with. Um, it's a quote by Kurt Gödel that basically says, the more I think about language, the more it amazes me that people, people ever understand each other. Um, one of the problems, that, the, the, I guess the problem area that I spend most of my time working in is called system level design or systems engineering, where you're, you're responsible for bringing together different aspects or different uh, facets of a design and understanding what those different facets mean together. And it's often the case that the people who design or who care about different aspects of a, of a, a system talk different languages and think in different ways. And bringing that information together can be a challenge. Um, I'm going to talk today about, about software-defined radios. And I, I don't know how, I never know when I go anywhere how familiar people are with the, the software-defined radio community. But basically what it's about is radios are currently one-shot designs right now. If you go to the store and you buy a radio, that radio will do precisely one thing. You can't reconfigure it to, to you can't reconfigure a radio to all of a sudden implement a new protocol. The idea of, of a software-defined radio is let's treat the radio like a PC, like a computing platform, and we'll compile radio descriptions down to that platform in the same in the same way that we do it for PCs. So the notion of a software-defined radio is very popular right now. Uh, is trying to make the radio a, a, a commodity platform. You buy a radio. And you can go out and buy different waveforms that you're going to implement on that radio. The cognitive radio is even more interesting. The cognitive radio takes, uh, I guess they don't have to necessarily be software-defined radios, but they typically are. The cognitive radio is a radio that senses and is, is aware of its environment. So for example, if I took a radio that was operating in the US and I took it to Germany and I turned it on, it would understand where it is and, and it would reconfigure its policies to deal with spectrum management in Germany rather than the US. Uh, other things, uh, optimizing communications, uh, policy adherence, I already mentioned, electrospace resource management, these are the kinds of things that cognitive radios are designed to deal with. So you have a front end on this radio that's actually doing some reasoning, uh, some sensing of the world around it, and, and reconfiguring according to what it senses. This is all a part of, um, this, is, this is all actually all over everywhere, but the part of it that I deal with is, is called the Joint Tactical Radio System. Uh, which is, is uh, where the military is going with its radios. And I put this up because um, they, they call this jitters. And if you know anything about radios, jitters is, jitter is a, horrible, a horrible thing to have in radios, but JTRS is, is, the, is the acronym. And what we're trying to do is define a, a way of synthesizing these radios and synthesizing these radios in a way that guarantees that they will meet certain kinds of constraints, system level security being, being one of them. Um, I, I have this slide up because this is, this is the, a list of, of a subset of the radios that are in production today that SDRs will implement. And I, I don't put this up to, to talk about any of the specific radios, but simply to say that um, you have to implement all of these radically different radios on a single platform, and all of these radios will require certification. They all have to go through a government certification process before they'll ever be fielded. Well, it's hard enough when you have a one-off box that, that, that implements one radio to get that radio certified. When now you have a, a system of compiling a radio description to a platform, that certification process has become an enormously more difficult process. So one of the things that we're trying to address is how do we certify certain things, in particular cert security, um, when we synthesize these radios. So this is an architecture. This is what's called a waveform architecture. It's, it's a generic picture 
of what a, a transmitter and receiver look like. This is the first picture that you, you see on the cover of, of our proposals. It's the picture that shows up on, on all of the nice glossies and whatnot. And this is the first picture that I saw of a software-defined radio. And this is a cool picture. If you're a synthesis person or a verification person, this is awesome. It's data flow. You put in data in the front end. It goes through this series of transformations that do various different things, communicate over a channel, and you reverse the transformations on the other side. It's data flow. I can do this. I'm excited. I'm excited. Problem is, it's not. Um, when we start thinking about some other aspects of the radio, um, we have to start thinking about, about issues other than just transform, transforming data, other than just getting data from one place to the other. The, the, one of the, the areas that I'm particularly interested in is looking at the security of these radios. If I'm going to field a radio, be it civilian or military, I want to know certain things about my data and the way my data is being handled. So that I, I'm going to start out by thinking about the three fundamental aspects of, of security. Confidentiality, availability, and integrity, the standard uh, CIA model, not CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, but, but confidenti confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So I'm going to start thinking about what, what, how, where, how, where these things manifest themselves in the radio. Well, the first thing I, I'm going to go to is the encryption and decryption components. That's going to give me a, a, a pretty good picture, or, or it's going to give me a, a, a pretty large piece of the functionality that I need to, to have, uh, have solid in, in encryption and decryption. Well, I've got a problem. All of a sudden, when I start thinking about, about exchanging keys and doing authentication, I'm not following my nice data flow pattern anymore. Now I've got out-of-band communication to get my keys exchanged. I've got authentication that goes on. And these things impact confidenti confidentiality and integrity. So I've got to worry about this, this new aspect that's outside of my main data flow. Um, and, but that's not bad. We, we, understand, we understand these aspects of a radio. Uh, we understand encryption is well understood, key exchange is well understood. This is not a problem. Um, however, we do have a problem when we start looking further. The next point I started looking at, uh, the radio people want to start looking at modulation and demodulation because we understand that really well. That's a place where my students and, and colleagues who are working on software synthesis can talk to the radio designers because modulation is a pretty easy thing to understand. All of a sudden, we have a different set of security concerns. We have to deal with, with establishing frequency hop sets. If you're doing a frequency hopper, establish, establishing hop rate. And all of a sudden, you have a completely different set of people talking about a completely different set of security requirements. But they impact the same things that we're concerned about. If your hop rate is known, you can't communicate confidenti confidentially. You can be snooped. Uh, if your hop rate is known, you can easily be jammed. Therefore, your availability drops. So now we have these, these, these system level requirements that are being impacted by, by the only two aspects of the radio that we've really looked at so far. Well, if we keep going, um, now we start thinking about error control, introducing a coding scheme. This is going to, going to impact integrity and availability. And I can go on and, and step through all of the different aspects of the radio, or all the different elements of the radio, and talk about how what they do impacts these system level requirements. Problem is that the guys who are talking mod and demod and the guys that are talking encryption and decryption are talking fundamentally different ways. And, and fun, uh, they're speaking fundamentally different languages. Um, they probably don't even hang out in the same building. Um, so you've got to somehow get all of these folks information in one place and being able, be able to deal with it together. Um, we, we have further problems in that this radio also has operational modes. It has a setup mode and it has a teardown mode. And those modes are, are different than the operational mode. When you're going through setup, you have to know that the radio that you end up with can be trusted. When you go through teardown, you have to know that none of your secrets have been exposed. You have to know that you aren't violating security problems. Uh, you have to also know that you can get the radio back when you tear it down, when you, when you shut it off. So we also have different operating modes that we have to deal with in addition to the different aspects of security. And finally, um, we're going to start thinking about other, other issues uh, besides security because they, they play an important role. Power, for example. Power attacks are very common. If uh, one of the ways to eliminate a radio is to, is to drain its battery, particularly if you're looking at sensor nets or some other kind of radio that can't be associated with a large power supply. Cost is an enormous problem. Uh, form factor also, when, when you start talking about 
a, a backpack radio that's the size of a kitchen refrigerator, you've got a problem. So form factor is also an issue. And we're also looking at this notion of evaluation and certification as another constraint that we have to deal with. So the idea here is what we want to be able to do is make system level guarantees about this entire radio when multiple people are, are going to be involved in the design and multiple people speaking different kinds of languages um, uh, are going to contribute to the radio design. So um, when we talk about system level mo modeling issues in the radio, I, I've, I've hit most of these already, but, I, but just to, to quick review, we've got multiple heterogeneous pers uh, perspectives. We have the information security folks up on top looking at encryption and decryption. We have the analog and digital signal processing guys, very different languages, energy, real time, form factor, all kinds of things going on there. We have heterogeneous domains or different languages that people are talking. Some folks are using continuous time and frequency domain. Other are use, are, are, others are thinking about digital signal processing. And others yet are looking at temporal and modal logics to think about security at the, at the information level. Um, I mentioned we have multiple operating modes, setup, operation, and teardown. And, and finally, we have, we have a, a system architecture that we have to deal with. You can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and start afresh. You've got a system architecture that you have to deal with. And we have to think about, about decomposing this, this thing and, and putting it back together. So um, for the last about nine years, I've been working on a language with, with, a, with a, a number of people uh, called Rosetta. Rosetta is a system level description language that's currently being standardized by IEEE uh, for dealing with this kind of problem. Uh, it, it explicitly provides support for uh, concurrent system level design. Concurrent design is, is, is the, the, the lingo, I guess, for thinking about multiple different perspectives simultaneously. Um, it provides something called facets and components for defining individual models, do domains for defining multiple, multiple models of computation or multiple vocabularies for design, uh, a facet algebra for composing models, and, and a mechanism for defining interactions between models that don't share a common language or they don't share a complete common language. Um, the semantics of Rosetta is formal. It has a set theoretic dependent type system. It's very similar to to what you'd find in PBS. Uh, it has a co-algebraic semantics. Uh, uh, I, 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 I would go, I'll, I'd be happy to go into that further with anyone who wants to talk about it, but it turns out that co-algebraic semantics are very nice for modeling the kind of non-terminating systems that we're dealing with here. Um, there's an, also an algebraic semantics underneath for defining local behavior. Uh, I won't go into the category theoretic model composition operations. We'll see that in a bit. Uh, and, a, and it's also reflective. Um, one of the things we have to have is a way to reflect on our specifications. Um, and one of the biggest things we provide is this notion of a heterogeneous extensible domain system. And I'll talk some about that at, in, in a bit. But basically what it does, it gives us the, uh, the ability to relate different languages um, for representing different characteristics. And then uh, also defining how uh, new languages or integrating new languages and defining how they interact with existing ones. Um, a standard slide I use a lot when I talk about Rosetta is, is the anatomy of a Rosetta spec. All this sounds good, but, it, but a, a, a picture is a really nice thing to have. So a Rosetta specification is written around something called a facet. I'll show you an example of that in just a second. A facet is a single specification in one domain, one system aspect. In fact, it very much resembles an aspect in aspect-oriented programming. Facets are written around something called a domain. And a domain provides a, a language for, or a vocabulary for writing specifications. Remember what I said, that, that the, the folks that are working on these radios that we care about all talk different ways. They all speak different languages. We have to have a way of, of, of embedding that language in our specification system where we have no hope. So we have these things called domains that we write facets around. We're going to take facets and compose them. Um, we're going to compose them. We're going to perform what we call uh, uh, horizontal, or excuse me, vertical composition, we're going to put them together and say this collection of models uh, defines a single component. And we're also going to assemble them structurally um, and, and talk about a collection of components defining a system, a collection of interaction, interacting components defining a system. And this comes uh, largely from hardware modeling, but the notion of structure is, is becoming more and more prevalent over the last, say, 10 years in, in software modeling. But when we first started talking about Rosetta to software folks, the notion of structure seemed kind of, kind of odd. But now that, that's, that's very, very much changed. Then we define something called interactions. 
between facets that allow, if I have one facet in one domain that, that, that uh, impacts another facet in another domain, I can move information uh, across boundaries and, and get those, those components to communicate. And we also have interactions that will reach across uh, components, uh, predominantly through interfaces, but we, we can also define interactions that, that allow uh, communication across components. What I'd like to do is, is, is kind of step into what Rosetta looks like um, and, and talk a little bit about the way we do specification. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the, the, the facet is a single model of, of a system aspect. And what this facet, this facet is taken from the actual body of specifications that we use for software-defined radios. This particular facet defines a, a QAM modulation function. Um, and if you know a little bit about QAM, uh, I've, I've, I've got a definition for what QAM, QAM down, is down at the bottom. But basically, I've got an enable signal that's going to turn the modulator on and off. And, and the inputs are related to the outputs by, uh, by this, this uh, a term, O tick equals enable and QAM modulation function. Now, the interesting thing that's going on here is uh, the domain that this is written in is, is discrete time. So I, I have the notion of state in this domain, and I have the notion of a next state. So I have tick. I have, in, in, in specification parlance, tick always means next. So tick is defined by the state-based domain, which, is, which is, is extended to give us discrete time. So the notion of tick, it has an explicit definition. It's there, and it, 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 uh, one's not guessing about what that thing means. Uh, parameters and variables provide a way to, to allow facets to communicate and also be specialized. Um, we have the notion of functions. All functions are pure. Uh, if we don't have pure functions, things get messy really quickly. Uh, one of the things that, that we've discovered in, in looking at VHDL and the addition of global variables is it's kind of a mess. All of a sudden, uh, dealing with the semantics of global variables and how different activities are synchronized becomes quite difficult. So that's what a facet looks like. Um, You'll notice things are borrowed from a lot of different languages. We borrowed a lot from Larch, uh, one of my favorite specification languages, one of the very first that I've learned. We borrowed several things from there. The type system is very reminiscent of PBS. Um, we've also, uh, in, the, in the definition of functions, we borrowed quite a lot from Haskell, which is our implementation language. So we, we've, we've begged, borrowed, and stealed from, from the best here uh, to, to, to define Rosetta. Uh, Rosetta also allows the definition of something called a component. And the specs that I end up writing the most end up being components. And I, I, I want to make sure that, that, that the, the uniqueness of what a component provides is, is well understood. There are three blocks to a component, the assumptions, the definitions, and the implications. Um, the assumptions define a collection of assumptions that must be met before this component can be used. If you don't meet the component that the key is confidential, then if I use this component, then I can't guarantee that, that the component will, will behave properly. Um, the definition, in this case, I'm simply referring to the, to the definition that you just saw. The definitions part gives me a, a set of, uh, of requirements for the model. And then finally, the implications give me a collection of correctness conditions that must be met whenever I implement this model. And in particular, the definitions and the assumptions together should imply the correctness conditions. Now, one thing that, that we provide that, that's very important in system level design is the notion of a justification. And you'll see the justification uh, with the, the double arrow backwards. Um, justifications are, are associated with things that we want to be true. And what they do is they give us an argument for those things to be true. They are not proofs. They can be proofs, but they are not necessarily proofs. So the hope is that as the system designer puts this together, he, he, he or she is recording the, the assumptions that are made when, when a component's defined. They're also recording what, what this component should make true, but they're also recording the reasons why they believe that these requirements are met. It may be a proof, it may be a code review, but I, I, and I can refer to whatever that is in, in the justification. Um, and, and this is critically important for certification. If I can build my system this way, and the system certifier sits down and looks through it, I've given them an argument for correctness for this, for this system. Um, and the component, it turns out, is where we end up writing most of our specification. Facets are, are very, very useful, and, and they are actually used to define the semantics of components. But the component it ends up being the workhorse of our specification activities. And again, this is a, this is a, a model that's taken directly from 
the, um, from the, the, the specs that we're writing right now for the software-defined radio. Uh, and this is defining, again, the AES modulation requirements. I will say that I, I fudged a little bit on the correctness conditions, um, but largely they're, they're what they should be. Uh, and the, the justification refers to um, uh, another system level spec that, that, uh, that we use to justify that, that particular implication. So we can, we can also assemble, I, I mentioned the notion of structural design, I can also assemble components. Uh, this is a, what we call a component waveform, and it represents that linear flow of components that we saw on the first slide. Uh, and it's parameterized over components. It's parameterized over other models. So when I instantiate this thing, what I'm providing um, are these components, compression, AES, modulation, and these things. I'm providing those definitions and plugging them together in a standard way. So I can define architectures and instantiate those architectures uh, in many different ways with many different types of components. Um, there is nothing, I, I wouldn't say there's, there's anything particularly unique to the architectures. Uh, they're, they're pretty standard structural things from, as I said, very similar to the hardware community. Yeah, do you have a question? Yep. That's a typo. Yeah, sorry about that. Should be in component waveform. Um, it's the third time I use the slides, and you're the first, congratulations, you're the first person that's caught it. So uh, this is how we put, put components mod to models uh, together structurally. Now, moving forward, I I've mentioned this notion of a domain. I'm going to go from, from how we write models to how the domains we write models with are constructed, how they're put together, how they're assembled. Um, and I mentioned already that domain, domains define vocabularies for specs. Um, they form a lattice. They, mathematically, they form a, for they form a complete lattice, um, which gives us some properties that we really want when we do verification. Um, and then they form a lattice because we define, we define domains by extending existing domains. We also define interactions between, uh, between models to allow us to explore system level properties. And I'll talk through this um, in, in the next few slides. Here's a, an example domain lattice. This, uh, as of about eight months ago, this was the correct one. It's not, we, we've done some revisions and I haven't updated my slides, but it's fairly close to what the, what the, the actual domain lattice looks like. Um, what this is defining is, is a collection of domains in which we write specifications. We start at the top with what's called the null domain, which is uh, a basic co-algebra that gives us nothing. We can't, we can't write really any specifications in that at all. We add to it all of the mathematical ideas and notions, uh, kind of a, a prelude to get what we call the static domain. It's static in the sense that it has no notion of time. It's not static in the sense that we couldn't define time in it. Um, we, we, we've kicked around what to call this domain quite a lot, but the static domain has no notion of time. It has no notion of change. As we see that the, the lattice branch out, what we see is the notion of time and change being added. There could be also the notion of, of physical, uh, what's the best way to say it, uh, of, of physical change moving around a surface, for example. But right now, uh, what we're pr predominantly concentrating on are temporal systems. And on one side, we have a signal-based uh, semantics. On the other side, we have a state-based semantics, representing the dichotomy or the, or the, the specification styles of process algebras versus, versus state-based specification styles. We further refine those. These are called unitive semantics uh, uh, specifications. There's no uh, magic notion of what a unitive semantics uh, uh, domain is. Uh, it basically simply provides a collection of definitions that we're going to refine later. The model of computation definitions gives the things that we define in the unit of semantics definitions meaning. For example, in state-based, I have state and change, and that's all I know. I have state and change, and that's all I know. So I'm going to refine um, my state-based specification into continuous state change and discrete state change, um, and I can refine further down, down the lattice and, and define different kinds of, of models. So uh, I also want to, want to mention real quickly uh, the notion of moving things around in, in the domain lattice, uh, the concept of a functor, which allows us to move things between specs. There are three kinds of functors, extensions, homomorphisms, and generalized functors. And I got the 10-minute the slide back there, so I can't spend much time here. Uh, but extensions are exactly the way they sound. The blue arrows are, I'm going to take one spec and extend it. A homomorphism isn't an extension, but it does preserve information. And a, a generalized functor need, functor need not preserve transformation over a, over a, 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 trans, uh, over a, a functor. 
So um, what we use these things for is to move models around. Um, what I'm going to do is write a, a notion of security or a model of security in the state-based domain. And that will have the notion of, of how things move as, as, or how things change as I move from state to state. And I can refine that if I have a, a, a system, whoops, too fancy. I, if I have a system, if I have a digital system, what I'm going to do is take my model of security and refine it down to the point where I can talk about that, that specification with respect to my digital system. Um, well, I can also go up as well. I needn't just go down. But the, this, this particular example that, that, again, comes from our, our radio uh, uh, world allows us to, to, to move down. So um, I can also use, this, this is basically a, a slide that depicts using functors for refinement. It's a, it's a repeat of the last slide. So I'm going, I'm going to skip this for now. I'm uh, happy to talk to anybody outside or after the talk. Uh, we can also verify these transformations in, um, in the lattice by using something called a Galois connection. Uh, one of my students is working to prove that abstractions are sound um, when we move up and down the lattice using a Galois connection. Um, I can also compose facets, and I'm, I'm not going to have enough time to do, to do examples here, but uh, suffice to say I have a collection of operations that allow me to put models together. Uh, I have product and sum, which are or and and is a good way to think about that. Homomorphism and equivalence relations. The notion of a functor is simply a function over facets. And I have instantiation and inclusion capabilities for including facet, one facet in another. Um, I, I have some examples of composing models that I, I, I'm, again, happy to share with, with folks after the talk. This is an, is an example of, of defining operation modes and as, assembling those operational modes disjunctively. Um, I do the same thing. In the, in the next model, um, sorry, in the next model, I put specifications conjunctively to say that the AES specification must satisfy its modulation definition and it also must satisfy its confidentiality constraint. Um, and these are done using products and sums, uh, standard category theory definitions that I won't spend any time on at all. Uh, I, I'll spend the rest of the time that I have on how we process Rosetta specs. Um, this is a, a, a picture of, of the, the, the RASCAL environment that we use to process specifications. Um, and the, the, one of the key things I wanted to mention was how we write the, the specific tools at the bottom. We do this using a technique using modular monadic specification. Uh, actually, the, the paper that we presented at last year's conference dealt with the way that we write these, these, um, uh, we write these, these language processors. Basically, we take bits of syntax, write processors for each of those bits of syntax, and then, build, then pull those processors together into an algebra that defines a transformation. Um, we also have defined, and this is again what our, what our paper was about last year, uh, we also define ways of, of assembling transformations together. Um, and it sounds like a very simple thing, but because of the monadic nature of our transforms, um, the, even sequencing can be a, a reasonably complicated thing to do. Um, and as I said, this is, this is work that we did last year and, and presented at the conference. So you can go back and refer to our ASE paper uh, from last year. Um, the synthesis of the software-defined radios is, uh, I've, I've hit most of this already. Uh, design once, use many. Defining radios for, defining domains for requirements definitions. We have a domain for radio component. Uh, we then instantiate that domain to do various different things. Um, we define domains for, for architectures and then glue our components together. And then we define functors to do our synthesis and our analysis of that system that we build. And this is, what the, this is the, the out, an outline of what, uh, what the specification system looks like or what the processing system looks like. Um, we are taking our specifications that we write in a, in a, in a high-level specification dom domain, transform those into a waveform domain, then move to what we call the intermediate domain, which is where I, I mentioned Garen Kimmel and Ed Comp. Right now, they're working on ways of moving specs from this intermediate domain into VHDL and uh, GNU radio so that we can actually synthesize radios. And the interesting thing here is we're taking the same spec to both places. We're, we're synthesizing both behavioral VHDL that we can run through a VHDL synthesis tool and also synthesizing GNU radio that we can put on a board. Um, uh, finally, uh, this is a, a, a kind of a definition or a description of why this is a hard problem. Um, 
what we have is is abstraction across the top and, and value down down the side, or, or excuse me, time down the side. What we're representing here is a collection of values flowing through the radio. And what happens is, as we decrease our abstraction level to the bit level, our symbol rate doesn't change, but our bit rate does. And our bit rate changes between specs. So we have a real problem when we, when we uh, set about synthesizing these things, dealing with the changes in, in, in symbol rate and bit rate between components. Um, a little bit of current status, and then, then I'll, 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 I'll close. Uh, the Rosetta language definition I mentioned is an IEEE, or is becoming an IEEE standard. Uh, we're working through the Design and Animation Standards Committee. Uh, it's about 70% complete. There's a book out on Rosetta, uh, one that's, that's in progress and is going to be in progress for quite a lot longer at this point. Um, the Rascal system is, is available for download if people are interested in it, although it's still rough at this point. Uh, right now we have a parser, printer, AST, non -A, uh, both recursive and non-recursive ASTs. Those things are complete and quite usable. Um, the, the language that we use to develop interpreters is, is complete and functional, and we've got several papers on that. Um, we have a, a prototype for uh, generating simulators. Um, that's also, uh, also quite usable at this point, uh, although it's a, it's a little bit brittle, it's still quite usable. The SAL and, and Isabel interfaces that we're using for uh, checking specs are, are in develop right now, and I don't feel comfortable handing those out at this point at all. We also have this nice Eclipse authoring environment that we put together so actual humans can use our tools. Um, for some reason, our sponsors thought running command line tools wasn't such a whippy thing. So we put together an Eclipse interface. And there are some other active uh, applications that are going on in, in, the, in the Rosetta Rascal world. In addition to the software-defined radio synthesis, uh, we're looking at PowerWare design. Uh, we're looking at specification of a, of a secure um, a secure operating system would be the best way to say it. Uh, also looking at specification of trust across the system between components. And if you're interested in this, in, in, in more information about what we're doing, the standard, the language status, all these things, uh, you can visit uh, www.rosetta-lang.org and, uh, and catch up with, what's, with what we're doing. I should also mention, I've got to do an ad for the standards committee. We have a standards committee that, that meets very regularly to talk about uh, semantics and whatnot. Um, if anybody's interested in participating in that, we would love more company, uh, particularly more really smart company to help us with the hard problems that we're dealing with right now. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. So um, you've talked about like using this for developing your radios, but uh, is that basically is this useful for sort of mere mortals that are just developing for, software? For for excuse for, me for, for like regular people that oh, are for, doing radios. For regular humans, um, if you were just doing software, that's kind of the, the, Rosetta started out in the world of hardware design. Um, what was what what happened in the in the late '90s? There was a a system level design quote revolution that that came about in the hardware community. Uh, all of a sudden. You're dealing with chips that had multiple cores, uh, frequently analog and, and digital components mixed together, all kinds of things working together. And the decision was made, and I think a valid one, that the current set of design languages, VHDL and Verilog, weren't going weren't to cut it there. So there was a movement to, to move away from those languages to try to find new things. Rosetta was one of those things. Um, System C, if you're familiar with that, was another of those. Um, I should also mention System Verilog and some of the VHL extensions. Um, what's, what's happened with Rosetta, though, is what we, did, what we figured out was that, that the hardware community um, was, was less interested in this than the software community was. So yes, we're doing software-defined radio, software radios with it, but many of our other projects, for example, I mentioned the secure system is a purely software system. Um, now, in that system, we do no synthesis. We don't try. That's not, we've not been asked to. I suppose we could. But um, we, we try to analyze the system level properties of a collection of virtual machines working together to accomplish a task. So yeah, you, you, you can go after software with it. It's not useful for going after device drivers or something, something low level. Uh, if, it's, if it's fairly routine code, then I don't think it's very useful for that. But looking at system level issues and, and integration of things, that's what we've designed it for.
Jamie. Uh, what about uh, validating the Rosetta specs, like making sure that you've got the right spec? Uh, do you have tools and techniques? For we that? don't really. We, we've looked a lot at verification, but we haven't looked a lot at validation. Um, I will say that that I, I mentioned the notion of a, of a simulator and the be able to, being able to generate a simulator. What we found, and I think what every person in the formal methods community has found, is that handing people theorems and, and lemmas and proofs is no good. It, that doesn't convince anybody. What we have to have is a simulation capability. That's the only thing that's ever going to give us. Um, we, we might get verification with, the, with theorems and lemmas and whatnot, but we're not going to get validation. What we hope is that the simulation will give, a, give the user an idea or a way of, of, of validating what they're looking at. But as far as providing a, a, a formal way, a, a designated way of doing validation, we really don't have that right now. Colin. So um, I'm interested in how open um, your system and Rosetta is to other formalisms and uh, tools. So I, I see that you have CSP, but by the sound of it, it sounds like you're you're recreating the semantics for that process algebra within the system. But equally, you could have uh, have an algebraic interface and have a functor to uh, look at other tools, model checking tools, or, or whatever. I, is that um, the case? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. One of the decisions that we have to make, we had to make this with the software-defined radios. Every problem we approach is, do we stay in Rosetta to do our analysis, or do we hop out? And, and what, you've, what you've said is exactly what we do. If I want to bounce out and use an existing tool, like Sal or Isabel, I define a functor that will, that will perform a specification transformation and spit out a model in a language appropriate for Isabel or, or Sal or whatever it is we happen to choose. Simulink uh, would, would be, would, would be a, an option yes. as well. But it, it's really hard to make this call about is it better to stay in Rosetta, to stay in the Rosetta semantics, and do your transformations in Rosetta, or is it better to hop out and use an existing tool? And we've we've done both um, for uh, for simulation, for verif sorry, for verification. We always hop out. I'm not a theorem prover guy. I, I I use them, but I don't write them. I don't, and I don't need to rewrite them. There's no way I'm going to compete with what's out there. So for our our um, Galois connection verification, we move out to Isabel. Uh, we're working right now to move specifications out to Sal for model checking. And Sal, we've chosen simply because that's what the sponsor wants to see. Um, but for the synthesis stuff, we stay inside because we don't have a good synthesis tool. So um, a supplementary question is, is there a well-defined method or procedure for other people to um, glue their tools, techniques onto your there is, it's not particularly well documented, but um, isn't, isn't that the standard response? <laughs> there is, but it's not particularly documented. Uh, there very much is, and, and that's something we have to have. Um, be, if, if for no other reason, the amount of legacy VHDL, Verilog, C++ out there is absolutely huge, and we can't ask people to rebuild it. So we have to be able to move in and out uh, of Rosetta, and that's something that, that um, I, I, had, I very quickly went through the picture of, the, of how we build our functors or how we build our tools with the module semantics. semantics. That's the standard way in which we, which we do this. And uh, we've got several examples of it. We have a, we have a, I think we have a methodology, but it's not written up any place yet. Thank you. I'm happy to sell you my students, though, if you'd like, if you'd like some of them. Thanks a lot.